Huh? Okay. Every class, it, it seems to be ringing. Okay. So this is the one, right? Input, integrate, and then this is the uh, the one that fires the action potential. Another term for action potential: a nerve impulse. Uh, what else? Um, electrical impulse. Okay. Don't forget for test the most fundamental function of any neuron is to generate action potentials. You remember you can classify neurons according to function, a sensory neuron, right? Sensory neuron. Okay, this one, look at this. Let's classify these neurons. This is a pin. So this is the stimulus. What type of neuron is this one? What type of neuron is this one? That was sensory, right? Oh, and you remember, this is the muscle, there's the axon, so what did this axon, neuron tell this muscle to do? Contract, so this must be motor. motor, very good. This must be interneuron, right? But whether it's a sensory interneuron, motor neuron, how do they do their job? Generate action potential. That's why it's, it says, for your test, the most fundamental function of any neuron of that uh, any neuron is to generate action potential or electrical impulse which part here which part of the sensory neuron detects the stimulus the dendrites about your axon yes very good which part here detects the stimulus always dendrite very good don't be confused because the test bank for your 20, oh, it has a question like that. And sometimes I use that for your test. The, it says, the nerve impulse conducting part of a motor neuron is what? Axon. The nerve impulse conducting part of a sensory neuron is what? It's just, yeah, it's always axon. I think it's just tricky questions, okay? So whether it's a sensory, it doesn't matter. The function of each part is the same. Don't forget, okay? So input is always here. This is always action potential, okay? Did you notice when I drew, there's always a space, okay? This is called the synapse. So neurons, they do not really, they do not physically touch. But your book, our book, or even on the internet, it looks like they're very, very close to each other. But if you magnify that, there's really a space. The space is called synapse, okay? Synapse. So a synapse will always consist or involve the axon terminal of one neuron and another cell. Because the reason I say another cell is here. This one is not a neuron, it's muscle. But there's the axon terminal. So this is also a synapse. So for this picture we have on the board, how many synapses do you see? Four. Thirteen? Wow! There's only three. Why are they counting? Don't forward. forget yeah. that in the test. That's a common mistake of students. They count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, 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 no. This is one synapse. This is another synapse. This is another synapse. Don't make that mistake. That's a very common mistake. Okay? Synapse is just one junction. There's just one junction here. Okay? If there's more nerve cells, there's more synapses. Yes. Each nerve cell gets one synapse. Yes. Okay, don't forget, that's a very common mistake. Sometimes they will even count these dendrites. I'm telling you now, but I'm sure one of you will write a different number. So, how many synapses do we see here? Three, right? Okay, and then... Uh, let's identify the different parts again. There's your, there's the cell body, there's the dendrites, and there's the axon. And all the way down here, there's a bulb. This is referred to as the terminal bulb or synap 
So it's it can be called terminal and valve. If you forget in the test, you ask me, I can remind you. But it's it looks like a valve, terminal and valve, or synaptic and valve. Okay. And in this terminal and valve is where neurotransmitters are stored. So the neurotransmitters are actually made here, protein synthesis, right? And then they move it or transport it here, and that's where they are stored. And I'm sure you're familiar with two general classes of neurotransmitters, the uppers and the downers, the excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. We're going to talk about that um, shortly. Okay, so, okay. Now we're going to go back to what we learned in chapter three. Do you remember the cell? Okay, where's the cell membrane of this neuron? This is the whole cell membrane, right? Right? You just changed the shape, but this is cell membrane all around here, okay? Where's the cytoplasm? All of this inside cytoplasm. It's just that the nucleus is over there, okay? Okay, if you remember from chapter 3, you remember the terms intracellular, extracellular, right? Mm -hmm. We apply that term because the cell membrane of every cell is made up of phospholipid bilayer that controls substances moving in and out. So there's a difference in concentration of substances in versus out. That's why we say intracellular, extracellular. You should know that all cells, all cells have a predominance of negatively charged substances inside. Lots of proteins negatively charged inside. So for, which means that all cells at rest, they are polarized. There's a charge. There's a difference in charge. Inside is negative, okay? For neurons, that negative charge is minus 70 millivolts. You understand so far? So this minus 70 is referred to as your resting membrane potential. Resting membrane potential. One more time. No, all cells have a difference in charge. They're all polarized. All cells have a predominance of negatively charged particles inside. For neurons, that's negative 70. So that's its charge at rest, resting membrane potential. It's polarized, okay? Now, I want you to recall, or maybe I didn't tell you, but the, there's two very important ions I want you to know, sodium and potassium. I think you know that sodium is most predominant outside of any cell. It is the most abundant cation extracellularly or outside any cells. It's always most abundant outside. All around, all around outside sodium. You understand? And potassium is most abundant inside all the time. Okay? All over here, potassium, potassium. Okay? Okay? So, you remember diffusion, right? Diffusion is the movement of substances down its concentration gradient. So, if you look at this picture, if sodium is most abundant here, the tendency for sodium is to move in. The tendency for potassium to move out, right? But what, and if, if that happens, you will change this charge. So what keeps them out? Sodium out, stay out, potassium stay in, is what you call the sodium-potassium pump. Sodium-potassium pump, sodium-potassium AP base. It's, it requires energy to keep sodium out, keep potassium in. You're preventing them from doing their natural tendency of moving down their concentration gradient. Are you all following so far? Okay? So you see, even at rest, even if you're not responding yet, your neurons require a lot of energy. 
Okay? So now I want to introduce you to gates. The reason why they can, you know, move in or out, you're always pushing them to their uh, respective compartments is because of the presence of gates. A gate is nothing but a channel that allows this electrolyte. So you have sodium gates, you have potassium gates, okay? The first gate I want you to know is called the leakage gate. Leakage gate. Okay? Leakage gate. So what's a gate? It's nothing but channels for these two electrolytes, sodium and potassium. Okay. So this, by the word leakage, they're always open. And this is the one that's responsible for maintaining that resting membrane potential of minus 70 millivolts. So in the leakage gates, you have the sodium-potassium pump that pushes sodium out constantly and potassium stays in constantly. Are you following everybody? Okay. Now, there's, so this is the case. At, where is that minus 70? All around, okay? Because it's all around. I'm just not drawing here, but this is all cytoplasm, right? Minus 70 all around. Where's potassium? All around inside the sodium all outside. Okay, everybody? Okay? Okay, so now I'm going to introduce two more gates. They're nothing but sodium potassium, okay? So two more types of sodium potassium gates. Number one was leakage gates. Another two more sodium potassium gates, one called mechanical gates. Another one called chemical gates. Mechanical and chemical gates. What are they? They're nothing but sodium potassium gates. Are you following everybody so far? Everybody? Okay. So this this one leakage gate always open, right? The pump is the one pushing sodium out, potassium in, stay in. So there's the charge. When there's a stimulus. Either this or this will open. So, when do mechanical gates open? Mechanical stimulus. Can you give me an example of mechanical stimulus? Touch, like touch, right? That's a mechanical stimulus. Stretching of your bladder, tickle, itching, mechanical. How about a chemical stimulus? Example of chemical stimulus. Huh? What did you say? Hormone? Yeah. What else? How about? Yes, carbon dioxide level in the blood. That's a chemical, right? Taste is a chemical. How did you taste? You must have opened a gate. So stimulus, in other words, for your neurons to generate an action potential, it requires opening of gates. What are these gates again? They're nothing but sodium and potassium gates, right? What is the difference between these two gates, mechanical and chemical, with leakage? Leakage have the sodium-potassium pump that constantly pushes sodium out and potassium in. But with these two, there's no pump. So once they open, the mechanical or chemical gates, once they open, what will be the tendency, the direction for sodium to move from out to in? Potassium from in to out. You see, you're changing the charge now. There's no pump in there to keep them back in their place. Yes? So, people that are depressed, they give them medicine, right? Which one would that be? Oh, that's a chemical. That's a chemical gate. Right? Medicine is a chemical. You're opening chemical gate. Do you understand the difference between the two chemical gate and mechanical gate? Yes. So chemical is a neurotransmitter or is it just... It's a neurotransmitter, yes. Okay. Like you said, what did you say? Hormones. Or dopamine. 
Those are your transmitters. Okay? Taste is a chemical. The level of oxygen is a chemical. Level of carbon dioxide is a chemical, right? What about what about pain? Pain is what? No. I'd say mechanical. Depends, right? If pain or nauseous, it depends on the type of stimulus. Maybe too much stress, uh, too much stretching. So too much stretching is still mechanical. Okay. So it depends on, on the cause of the pain. Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. One thing I want you to know, there's a difference between the sodium and potassium gates. Okay. Sodium is a fast gate. Potassium is a slow gate. So potassium is, is a K, right? Like slow poke. There's a K in there. That's how I try to remember. So potassium, both of them, okay, will open. Except sodium is fast. Potassium is always a slow poke. Besides, you say, you speak the word potassium, it takes longer to speak it than sodium. You're done. So it's a fast gate, potassium slow gate. You understand? So look at what's going on. If sodium is quick to open, potassium is slow. Don't you think that there'll be a lot of sodium going in, only a little bit of potassium trickling out? So if a lot of sodium going in, what will happen to the charge? Will it become more negative or less negative? Yes. You're depolarizing it. Depolarize. That's what happens when you stimulate. You depolarize it. Yes? So if that if medication is causing like gates to open and close. Yes. Tomorrow, yes. Okay. It depends. Again, maybe yeah. if it's a depressant, your your Yeah, I'll show you what gates, okay? Okay? You understand so far? So at rest, we go back when we're resting, we have leakage gates. Charge is minus 70. There's leakage gates. What are these gates? They're nothing but sodium and potassium, right? With leakage, always open for sodium and potassium, but you have the sodium-potassium pump. Push sodium out, keep potassium in, you keep that minus 70. In the presence of a stimulus, you open more gates, but this time there's no sodium-potassium pump in there, right? So those gates, depending on the stimulus, a mechanical stimulus will open mechanical gate. Chemical stimulus will open chemical gate. What is that? Sodium, potassium. What's the difference? Fast sodium, slow poke, potassium. So which means lots of sodium rushes in. Only a little bit of potassium trickles out. Causing this minus 70 charge to become less, less, less negative. A stimulus depolarized your neuron. Where? The, the cell body dendrite area. You depolarized it, and if the stimulus is strong enough to change the charge to minus 55 millivolts, this is referred to as the threshold potential. If a stimulus is strong enough to introduce sodium ions inside to bring it to minus 55, at that point right here in this area right here, this part of the axon, the first part of the axon is called the trigger zone. So if there's enough charge here at the axon gillet area, the trigger zone, if the charge here gets to minus 55, that's it. You're going to fire an action potential in the axon. The axon part of any neuron does not need a stimulus for the opening of its gates. They have a different kind of gate. It's called voltage gate. So here in the axon part, the sodium-potassium gates are called 
voltage gates because they will open not depending on a stimulus. It is charge driven. They use the example of pulling the trigger, right? All you need is to pull the trigger and it fires. You can't say, oops, I changed my mind. You pull it, it's going to fire. Or like uh, when you plug something, right? All you need to do is plug it in and then there's the current. Just plug it and there it is. That's the same thing here. All you need to do is stimulate here, right? Up to minus 55 when you get to this trigger zone. If you hit that, it will fire because it's charge driven. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. That's why it's called voltage gates. What are they again? It's the same. Sodium, potassium. And what's the difference? Fast sodium, slow potassium. You understand, everybody? Mm -hmm. And you remember that, so it will just open one by one by one by one. It's just charge driven. So this will open first, then the charge will, will trigger opening of this one of the next one, of the next one, of the next one. You understand? Okay? And the sodium and potassium will stay open and lots of sodium will go inside until the charge inside changes to positive 30. So positive 30 millivolts is referred to as the peak of action potential, meaning that will be the signal. When enough sodium ions enter the cell so that the charge reaches positive 30, that's the peak, that's the signal for then the sodium and potassium gates to close. But what's the difference again? Fast sodium, slow poke. So do you see that? If the sodium is already closed, can sodium still go inside? No more. But because potassium is low poke, potassium can trickle out. So potassium, which is positive, trickles out. You're going to restore the charge to minus 70 again. You see that? So did you need a stimulus here? No. It's charge driven. That's why you call it voltage gates. What are all these, vo uh, these gates? They're nothing but sodium and potassium. But you see, they have their names because they have different characteristics. This one always open. This one responds to stimulus, mechanical stimulus or chemical stimulus. This one is charge driven. In the axon, you will not find mechanical gates or chemical gates. You will only find voltage gates and, of course, leakage gates. You understand? So, you remember we talked about myelination? Right. 